hello, I'm Edie Storer, the co-director of the Belmont Gallery of Art. It's nice to see friendly and familiar faces this evening. Um, we are having a special event tonight to uh, celebrate the Correspondences show. Here's Magnus, <laughs> uh, which is called Correspondences uh, Iceland to Boston, which has the photography of Bert Halstead and Magnus Norrison. <laughs> uh, tonight we have uh, Meg Muckenhaupt, who is going to do a special talk on Boston. Uh, a couple weeks ago we had a special talk from Heidi Herrmann on Iceland and, uh, you know, filled with glaciers and ghosts and weird things. But I know that Meg has her fair share of glaciers, at least, so. Uh, uh, I just wanted to introduce Meg. Meg's a, a local author. Um, she is an author and communications professional, and her writing has been in, amongst other places, the Boston Globe, the Broad Institute, and the Annals of Improbable Research, which I would <laughs> love to check out sometime. <laughs> Among the books she's written are Cabbage, A Global History, which is part of a series, uh, Boston's Gardens and Green Spaces, and my favorite, The Truth About Baked Beans, An Edible History of New England. Um, <clears throat> and then for the local folks, she spent over 18 years uh, working with the Belmont Citizens Forum as a writer and editor for the newsletter. So keep it up, Meg, we appreciate you. <laughs> Good work. I appreciate you, and you should definitely admit Margot Ballou, because I haven't seen her since graduate school. Oh, cool, cool. <laughs> oh, welcome, Margot. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction to Dean. Uh, my name is Meg Muckenhout, and although my job is to talk about Boston, since this is a correspondences exhibit, I'm going to be uh, looking at correspondences between, a, between Boston and Iceland and Ireland, uh, between ice and water and land, between fish and sheep, it's all going to be sort of woven together. And uh, I have slides. So it's going to look like it's just your computer talking to you over images for most of the next 45 minutes or so, but I am here, I'm real, I live here, but this is not my real office, although much as I would like it to be. So with little ado, I'm going to share my screen. May I have confirmation that you can see a big screen that has my charming face in the lower right at this point? You have confirmation. Yeah. There you are. Okay. Then we're going to go going. Okay, so this is the talk you're coming to. If you've expected something else, you still have time to leave, but stay here. Don't leave. <laughs> okay, don't leave. Stay here. Okay. Um, since there are very few of us, um, Adine, I'm going to leave it to you, but if people have questions, raise their hands in the chat or wherever it is. I'm happy to stop and address things as we go along. Uh, it's at your discretion. So okay. I'll, I'll keep my eye on it. And if someone okay. raises a hand, I will let them know or let you know. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. All right. So um, again, this talk is going to be sort of woven together. Uh, I've written the book about Boston Gardens and Green Spaces about the landscape history of how people use land in Boston and why. Uh, I wrote The Truth About Baked Beans, which was about sort of a cultural history of New England food. Why do we think that some food is New England-y, that belongs here, that describes us, that's what people in New England are supposed to eat and why, which is not necessarily the same thing as what people in New England actually eat which you know is frozen burritos as much as anything else. And uh, that's a sheep because we're talking about Iceland. Uh, Magnus, I know it's not the only image of Iceland that we have here, but this is the one that I have. Um, and just to emphasize it, I'm going to be uh, talking about a couple of the images we have from the exhibit as we go along. I chose this first one by Bert, uh, who again, both Bert and Magnus are very gifted photographers and have some beautiful images. Uh, see how all the water is flowing together in different streams and the streams are coming back and diverging and coming together again this is what this talk is going to be like we're going to be coming back again and again to a couple of different topics about ice and water again about different peoples in new england and their relationship to each other and the relationship to people in other places and how land changes over time 
as a result of human activity, of what we do. So it's going to circle around a couple of times. It's not going to be straightforward because we're going to be bouncing back and forth. It's okay. Look at what a beautiful picture you can get out of it. So just keep Bert's pictures in mind as we go through this talk. All right, next slide. Why do Boston and Iceland look the way they do? Ice and water and humans. This is not the only answer. There, there are plants and things there too, but a large reason why these places look the way they do now, which is different from how they looked 400 years ago, which is different from how they looked 1200 years ago, which is different from how they looked 12,000 years ago, has to do with how ice and water have moved and continue to move and with human intervention. So let's talk about ice, ice baby. Do, 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 do. And look, we're back in another one of Bert's beautiful pictures. Here is a glacier and a reflection. Take a good look at that. That's ice, that's persistent across the seasons that moves. Glaciers are not constant things. They don't just sit there, they flow down sometimes, sometimes they draw back. And this looks a lot like my next slide, which is of what the Boston Public Garden looked like 12,000 years ago. Okay, well, 14,000 years ago, because it's 12,000 BC. Um, and in Boston, of course, since we are at a looking at a picture of the public garden, it wouldn't be complete without the swan boats. Aren't they beautiful? Why am I talking about this? Because Boston was covered by an enormous ice sheet. As you can see, this is a map of what it looked like about 12,000 BC. The Labradorian sector, the word Labrador is going to come up again a little bit later too. Um, mile of ice all on top of everything, going down about to where I grew up in New Jersey, which is right at that little line down there. Um, when I first started doing talks about my Boston Public Garden book, I got a comment from an older woman who was not entirely kind, who said to me, you're not from here, are you? And she was right. I grew up in New Jersey, although my family has been in New England since 1630, but I was born in New Jersey. It wasn't my fault. I didn't have any choice about it. I'm back here now. She thought I wasn't being entirely respectful towards the parks. And uh, we're gonna talk about a couple of things in this, this session that may seem disrespectful, but they're about what humans do in public places, which is sometimes beautiful and nice and sometimes a little bit icky, which affects what happens in parks. But we'll talk about that later. But keep in mind, ice. Ice is not just in Iceland. Ice is all over North America. Ice is crushing things. Ice is moving rocks from the north to the south. Remember, glaciers don't move things from south to north, they move things from north to south. Um, one of the things that's getting crushed is the soil, which is one reason there are no native earthworms in New England, which I think is pretty funky. All the earthworms you have in your garden, they're from Europe. They weren't here because, you know, they couldn't survive because there wasn't any place for them to the earth and they didn't make it here until after the pilgrims survived. Why is this relevant to Boston? I mean, the entire Eastern seaboard was covered with ice um, from New Jersey up. Well, this has to do with why people settled in Boston. Um, the, our lovely Puritan, not ancestors, because a lot of us aren't descended from Puritans, but the people who showed up here in 1634 didn't settle on the, what was called the Shawmut Peninsula, by the people who were here before the Puritans, the Massachusetts and other local peoples. Um, they reached the Europeans who arrived here originally went over to Charlestown and hung out there for a while. And they had problems because they didn't have a good access to fresh drinking water that was accessible during high tide. I'm not exactly sure where it was, uh, but they, they couldn't get to it several hours away. There wasn't really enough for the animals. They came to the Shawmut Peninsula because there was a source of drinking water there. The Shawmut Peninsula is the old name for what we think of as central Boston now. You may have heard it in the name Shawmut Bank. A lot of names from old times persist. We don't necessarily know their meaning, but you can find it out if you look enough. So I'm just gonna read um, the top paragraph here because I'm sure it's very small on your screens, which is that the Puritans settled at the base of Beacon Hill because it is made of stratified sand from a glacial outwash channel. The layered deposits allow groundwater to flow and pool at the base where the settlers could collect it for drinking water. So basically Beacon Hill, all the hills that were in Boston at the time 
And you know the word Tremont Street, Three Mountains? Once upon a time, there were three mountains in downtown Boston. There aren't, and we're gonna talk about why in a couple of minutes. They're made of piles of sand. And if you've ever been to the beach, you pour water on the sand and it comes right through, shh, flows right out the bottom. This is what would happen when it was rain in Boston and other times as well, as the water would just drip down through the sand out to a spring at the bottom. And to give you an idea of what that might've looked like, I'm gonna pull up another one of Bert's photos. Bird calls this fog fall, but what I want you to look at is over on the left there. This is at the bottom of the Vatna Yachtel Glacier, which I'm probably mispronouncing. Um, I've traveled to Iceland, but I am not very good at pronouncing Icelandic names for things, but it's the bottom of a glacier and see all that sand that is piled up on the left. Imagine Beacon Hill being made of that, sure with bits of plants and various things growing on top of it, but the same idea that water can come through very easily, come out at the bottom where there might be a, a clay layer left from some previous geological era and drips right out into Spring Lane, which is right off of Water Street in Boston. If you go to Spring Lane, you will see this clack to Reverend William Blackston, who was actually the first guy to get here in 1630 set up his farm, planted fruit trees, and decided he wanted to leave when the people who settled in Charleston came over and said, can we please, 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 please stay here because you are drinking water. Reverend Blackstone escaped down to Providence where you may have been uh, heard of the Blackstone River, which is named for him. So he continued to be associated with water even after he moved away from Boston. Mr. Blackstone is an interesting guy. He came in with people who arrived down in Weymouth and then he decided he didn't like them, went to Boston, decided he didn't like the people moving in from Charlestown, went to Providence. He was not a guy who liked to stay in one place. Or maybe he just didn't like the people who were coming. I don't know. But anyway, if you go to Spring Lane in Boston, which is near downtown crossing, pretty near where Magnus took this picture, of holiday shopping, it's just down the street, you will see that plaque. And if you're there in the summer, you may see someone in a tri-corner hat pointing it out to somebody. I've seen that happen on more than one place. So, you know, all this holiday shopping is happening down around the corner from a pile of sand or what was once a pile of sand. We're gonna talk about how that may not, wasn't there anymore either in a moment or two. Glaciers brought the sand, made it possible for people to settle in Boston and have a source of drinking water because it, the water would percolate down through the sand. But there's other evidence of glaciers that have affected what people did in Boston and where and why. And I'm going to show you a couple more of those. One of those is drumlins. Drumlin is a type of hill, looks like a whale. It's got the little end and it gets bigger, then it goes way down and get smaller. And they are found all around Boston. Uh, Bunker Hill is a drumlin. Breed's Hill is a drumlin. Drumlin Farm in Lincoln is, does have a drumlin. And the Boston Harbor Islands is a set of drowned drumlins with their bases underwater. They are the only set of drowned drumlins in the Northeast United States. It's fun to say. Uh, but you can really see the evidence of what they look like here from Great Brewster Island and the other uh, Boston Harbor Islands. If you want to see how these things developed, if you have a driveway this week and you've put sand down on top of the ice, watch the patterns in the sand that develop as the ice is melting. And you will see many drumlins forming in some places as the ice recedes and your sand gets deposited on your driveway. You may also see eskers, which are sort of long, narrow ridges made in the same way. Or you can go out and sprinkle some sand now and see what sort of patterns happens as your ice melts. It's, um, you can see the microcosm and the macrocosm as they say. But yes, drumlins, we have those around Boston, evidence of glaciers. Uh, another evidence we have of the glaciers and the ice that was here that you can't see anymore are all our glacial kettle hole, kettle hole lakes. Um, you can see in this illustration that when a glacier receives, it calves, it leaves what they call dead ice that isn't connected to the big mommy glacier anymore. It's just sitting there, poor lost thing. And as the glacier continues to melt, it lets sand out. That's what they outwash is. That's the gravel and sand the glacier has picked up from the north and it's 
letting it go as it melts and can't support it, all that stuff that's embedded in the ice. And what you end up is these very distinctive, um, deep, very steep-sided lakes, such as Walden Pond. You know, it has pretty steep drop-off once you get past that little roped-in area. Those are people who are not wearing protective equipment for swimming across open water in the lake, but they could get away with it back then. Jamaica Pond is also a glacial kettle pond off in Boston. Again, you can see that the ice melted. You can see the water now. These are ways that glaciers have affected Boston. But another thing that affected Boston's landscape is water and how people responded to water and what people did with water, which wasn't where they wanted it. So let me show you about what Boston looked like in the 1770s. You may recognize it, you may not. Ta-da! Here's the good old fashioned Shawmut Peninsula. Um, if you look up towards the top, this is the North End where it says Mill Pond, if you can see very small things. Over here on the right, that's Long Wharf going off into the ocean, very, very long. Um, a fair, basically, the shoreline started about where Faneuil Hall is now and everything that's you know over to the east of that is extra. Down here is the Dorchester Neck. And uh, for those of us who were raised in places like New Jersey. This is especially interesting because I was raised in the era of Johnny Tremaine. And I remember very clearly being told, one if by land, two if by sea. And I remember thinking, because I would drive up to visit my grandmother, Newton. See, I did have family in Massachusetts, even though I'm not from here. And looking at the map and thinking, why would anybody go by sea? You can just like take the road and go west and maybe go over a bridge. Why, why would you go across boats? That's really impractical. Until I saw this picture of what the Dorchester next looks like. That is an extremely narrow, extremely vulnerable area down there. There was a, a sculpture called something like Sound Wave in Peters Park in the South End a few years ago, which showed just how wide that neck was. It was, you know, only on the order of about 40 feet. It's hard to march a lot of us there. The other thing to notice here is that you can see a bunch of lumpy bits right in the center here. These are sort of the three mountains here. And uh, down here is the Boston Common but there's no public garden because it's underwater. Everything that's on the side here is tidal. There isn't any dam up here. When the tide comes in, it goes way down the Charles River. Everything's affected by salt water. Everything is affected by the tides. Just to make this a little more obvious, this is a picture, old Boston is approximately what we're seeing there. It's in black. Everything that's in gray is water. <laughs> um, a lot of these are tide flats, places where you could go clamming, places where you could uh, mow down salt water, salt meadow cord grass to feed your animals, but it's not a place where you want to go walking around too much. You'll lose your shoes. They'll get sucked off by the mud. This is a map from a book called Mapping Boston from MIT Press. And if you're that kind of person who likes to look at old maps, this is a lot of fun because it shows what parts of Boston were constructed when. Okay, the statistics you standardly see are that 50% of Boston was filled in, is made land. And depending on what you consider part of Boston versus Alston versus Brighton versus Brookline, it's pretty much true. And what you can see on this map are the sequences, the eras when different parts of land were made. You've got the dark green, which is you know what was here when Europeans arrived. You've got the slightly lighter green, which is what was filled in between about 1630 and 1795. And um, this is sort of freelance land filling. This is mostly people going off the end of their dock and saying, hey, if I had a deeper dock going out in the harbor, harbor I could get bigger ships to come in, um, especially over on this side where about where Faneuil Hall is, is now. And they would just go dump whatever the heck they could get their hands on. You know, old crockery, whatever is in the privy, anything, any kind of gravel or trash to build up 
the land enough so they could sink more pilings so they could extend their dock out. And this is one reason why there's such great archaeological digs in, in Boston, because you know people are dumping stuff in the middle of town all the time to make their docks bigger. After 1795, you start getting whole-scale government-sponsored land filling to make more land area. Um, you get the filling in of the Back Bay. You get the filling in of, you know, basically all of South Boston. Um, later, you get the building of the airport in East Boston in the 20th century. Um, one of the things I love about this map is you can see all the things that are called island in Boston that are no longer islands that actually were islands like there's a wood island park that actually you know was connected islands over here castle island which i always thought of as being castle peninsula oh look there's actually an island there it just hasn't been an island for more than 50 years at this point um this is a lot of land this is a lot of old tidal flats this is a lot of space where humans live and work now that just did not exist before 1630. And there are a couple of questions you might want to ask here. One is why, why do people do all this? You know, we're on a continent. There's 3000 miles of land to the west of us. Why, why put all this stuff here? And the other question is how, how where did they find all the, the gravel to put in here? And I'll answer those questions as best I can in a moment. First, let's talk about where that gravel came from. So this is a picture of the Trimount in 1630, according to a person who made this lovely painting in 1836. Um, one of those is Beacon Hill, one of them is Mount Vernon, one of them is Mount Pemberton. Of those, Mount Vernon and Mount Beacon are a little, little bit of what they were, and Mount Pemberton has disappeared altogether. Um, one thing to note in this interesting illustration, we've got the arriving Europeans and we've also got this curious crowd of people in the lower part of the painting who are firing arrows and salute, who are pointing at the people in that boat who are going over to what is going to become Boston. Uh, the person who made this painting didn't say who these people are, what they wanted, what they thought of these new people arriving there, but they, they included them. They're there, but they're put in the background. They're sort of not treated as significant. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the people who were here when the colonists came a little bit later in this. But anyway, this is not what the Boston skyline looks like now. So hold, hold the people and the skyline in your mind as we go to our next slide. This is what Beacon Hill looked like in 1811 when it was being taken down to fill in the area around what is now North Station. Uh, if you go to Beacon Hill today, you will see another version of this monument with a golden eagle on top. It had to be replaced in 1876 after a hurricane. The top of the eagle where it is today is where the top of the hill was in 1811. Why did they take Beacon Hill down? Partly because it was really valuable to fill in more land in Boston at the time, but also because, you know, living on top of a hill wasn't that popular back in the early 19th century. Um, it's inconvenient. You know, look at those people dragging things around horses on wheels. We didn't have all those snow plows that people complain about, you know, I had to put all that stuff in my driveway and then I had to shovel it out again. Well, imagine having to shovel out an entire street. Imagine trying to get groceries up your hill on a horse drawn sled in the middle of January. The people who lived on Beacon Hill during colonial times and Federalist times were either very rich or very poor. The middle class didn't want to be bothered. They didn't have servants who could take stuff up there. They, they could afford to be somewhere else, or they could didn't have the servants to survive up in a place like that. So you end up with the interesting parts of Beacon Hill that it has some very wealthy houses, but it's also where the African-American meeting house was and where there was um, a significant you know, free black community. It, it's part of the African-American history of Boston, these two sides of Beacon Hill. But why did Bostonians make all this land? Okay. And yes, later, just before we leave behind the question of landfilling, you know, after 1835 or so, uh, Bostonians were bringing in gravel by the train load from Needham and then even farther on to fill in land. But why were they doing this? Why, why do this? Land 
America is land, 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 land. The government kept on giving it away for free. But anybody would just put down stakes there. Johnny Appleseed went out and was throwing around pits and things like that out in the hinterlands about a century later. Why did people make all this land? Okay, money. Network effects. Today, if you want to make money, make the biggest deals with the biggest people, you go off to Silicon Valley. I can't really say that Boston was the Silicon Valley of the 1780s, but Port City, this is where you make deals with people bringing stuff in and taking things out. You know, we're not a country, part of the country that was growing cotton, but we sold it. We didn't grow pineapples or rice or tobacco, but we sold them and we traded them. Um, New England was about manufacturing and deals and fish, which, you know, we did have up here and I'll talk about them in a moment. But, you know, as a port city whose economy depended on trade and later uh, sending crews to New York to staff ships that were trading down there, Boston was very good at doing things like insuring sea voyages and staffing them in the uh, first half of the 19th century when the trade to Boston itself kind of died down. And if you had a place where you could set up shop, you could make serious cash and you needed people to work in your business making serious cash. Uh, place to be, place to find your fortune and a place where the population went up and up and up and up, um, you know, going up by a fact of more than eight in 60 years. People needed somewhere to live, they needed somewhere to work. Railroads. I love this picture of the Boston Lowell Railroad from 1835. Railroads, great transportation option, great way to get goods and get people around. They need depots. They need stations. They need places to put tracks. They need places to be. And Boston needed more land to put the railroads in. And actually, the railroads that were built crossing the river also made it something of a necessity to build more land. Why? partly because they blocked that flow of water. I'll show you in the next slide. Okay. Prior to the 19th century, the Boston Public Garden was a marsh and the Back Bay was the Back Bay of the Charles River, which was a tidal mud flat. Um, when the railroads got built, when a particular dam got built, the flow of water in and out of the Charles River Basin got blocked. And before 1870, Boston didn't have any central sewage lines going out into the harbor, okay? You would have these little sort of freelance sewers going under the streets, just little pipes. They would take things out and they'd put them in the closest waterway. If you're on the harbor side, they'd go out to the harbor, that's fine. If you're on the Charles side, they go out to the Charles, except that with all the different construction that was blocking the water, less and less stuff got taken out with the tide over time. The tide became weaker and it stuff built up. I'm gonna read you a little quote from 1849 uh, by an engineer reporting for the city of Boston, which said, Back Bay at this hour is nothing less than a great cesspool into which is daily deposited the filth of a large and constantly increasing population. A greenish scum many yards wide stretches along the shores of the basin as far as the Western Avenue Mill Dam, that's basically where Bacon Street is now, whilst the surface of the water beyond is seen bubbling like a cauldron with the noxious gases that are exploding from the corrupting mass below. One of the reasons the back bay was filled in was to push the problem of dealing with all that water a little bit further away from where most people were living at the time. Uh, this photo is actually of a sewage spill in, in Bainbridge Island, Washington, but I thought it was evocative. Why else did people make more land in Boston? The Irish. Boston had a lot of immigrants, even before the Irish potato famine, the famine years of 1845 through 1850. Um, by 1850, 35,000 of Boston's 136,000 residents were Irish immigrants. I'm trying to think of how to say this politely, but it's hard to say it politely. Basically, all the Yankees living in Boston weren't happy about this. They didn't like the Irish. They didn't like immigrants. Uh, the entire Massachusetts state legislature, including the governor and the treasurer, everybody else in 1852 were elected from the Know Nothing Party, which was basically just a party that opposed immigration. 
the the city fathers of Boston were terrified that all of the gold old New England stock, their power base, were going to move out of town because of the Irish, and decided that it was very important to provide more space for the old money people in Boston to live that was farther away from the harbor. Back Bay. It's the Charles side. It's far away from the docks where all of those people work. Um, when it was filled in, the project starting in the 1850s, not ending until the 1870s, there were scandals when some of the land was secretly sold to people of society before the official auction of lots was beginning, just to make sure that they would get their friends to buy lots there too. There was corruption. Fancy that, corruption in Boston around this land. Um, but if you look at the Back Bay, if you look at the layout of Commonwealth Avenue and the mall, it was specifically supposed to be a higher class area to attract all, to keep those Yankees, those old Protestants from engaging in white flight and leaving Boston. We got a nice mall out of it. But why were the Irish here in Boston? Why didn't they go somewhere else? Again, there's lots of America out there. People could have gone to Florida, which is where people in Boston tend to go nowadays when they're tired of living up here in the cold and the snow and everything else. This is connected to water. Here's a little map of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, Ireland was horribly oppressed during the, the, the famine. Uh, there were lots of horrible policies by the British government that affected the people of Ireland. And I'm not trying, not trying to downplay that. Here, I want to acknowledge the suffering and acknowledge the bad governments which led to the, the, the suffering and to people immigrating. But right here in this slide, I also wanna look at continents and currents. Here's Ireland over here in green. Here's Iceland up here in blue. Here is a current which takes you over towards Canada. And a lot of people leaving Ireland to immigrate in the 19th century did stop in Canada and Newfoundland and other parts of Canada before they came down to Massachusetts and down towards New York. These currents up here from the Labrador Sea mixing with the Gulf Stream, they also help timber coming from Canada. One of the reasons it was relatively cheap to come from Ireland to the United States is that there was a big business in shipping of timber from Canada to Europe where many of the forests had already been exhausted, where they'd been chopped down, where timber was a really important commodity and they needed something to ship on the way back to make their travel worthwhile and basically treated people from Ireland as cargo people they could put in the holds, fill up cheap, and get some money on the return journey. But these currents up here, the Gulf Stream mixing with the Labrador current up here, make this area of the ocean very fertile. There's a lot of nutrients mixing, a lot of mixing of water columns, things are welling up from below and coming down from on top, and it makes it a very fertile area of the ocean for fish. This is a cod head. This is a cod head in Iceland. This was actually a cod head eaten by my husband on the island of Heime, which is off the southern coast of Iceland, one of the major fishing ports. And those of you who are fans of bizarre geology can go read about how the people of Heime uh, dealt with a catastrophic volcanic eruption there uh, 50 years ago in the 1970s and their attempt to make a wall of lava by spraying water on erupting lava to route it around the town because it's one of the few harbors in the south of Iceland where you can you know, land fishing boats. Um, this is not how most cod fished in Iceland, which has a cod industry, or off the coast of New England has historically been served. Uh, it just looks more interesting than a hunk of salt cod. Salt cod. You take fish out of the ocean, you put it somewhere, dry, preferably where there's wind blowing, you put salt on it and it becomes basically a rock. It's hard, you can keep it almost forever, you can take it on long ocean voyages, it doesn't need refrigeration, it's, it's permafood. Um, and it is an old food. The first mention of salt cod, which is also called stockfish, is found in Ale Saga, which is from a, 
Icelandic manuscript, which dates to 1240, but is reporting on events that were supposed to have happened in 875, when Thorfold um, Kvedelsen brought a supply of stockfish to Iceland from Heideland in central Norway. So yeah, stockfish, salt cod. It's been an important part of the economy in Scandinavia for a long time, except for a little while in the 16th century when the fish around Iceland failed. Salt cod was a big deal in Europe. You're talking about an area of the world, in this case, in the 16th century, around 1565, where fisheries were failing around Europe, where basically they were being fished out because there was so much demand for protein. You know, there are lots of people living in England and France and Germany, uh, many of whom believe in eating fish one day of the week on Fridays because they are Catholic, but also who want a cheap, easy to store source of protein. Meat is very expensive. One of the things that people talk about when they emigrate to the United States pretty continuously from 1630 through the 19th century and onwards is how cheap it is to get meat, how they can eat meat every day. This was not the case for average people living in London in 1570. Salt cod was one of the few things that a lot of poor people could afford that would give them protein, except that people were running out of it in the 16th century. It was getting fished out. A lot of the fish had already been fished out of European rivers. Salmon had disappeared from most of Poland, you know, more than a century ahead of time. People were looking for more places to get fish. And as they kept sailing on those currents, I showed you a moment or two ago, they came over to the New World. They found the Grand Banks off of Newfoundland, and they found the cod off of Nova Scotia, and then George's Bank in Massachusetts. Here's a picture of what a codfish operation looked like in Quebec in 1698. It's an illustration. It says, les pêches des murets, uh, I can't even remember, vert et sec. Um, they would preserve fish by drying it, but also sometimes they would stuff them in the barrels with a lot of salt and keep them wet and moist. But most of it's salt cod. And you can see, you know, this industrial style operation with towers and towers of layers of places where they would put the cod out that was salted to dry in the wind in these developments on the coasts of Newfoundland, on the coast of Nova Scotia, to ship them back to Europe. This was a big business. And it was a big business for people settled in Massachusetts after 1600 as well. Um, you may have heard the old canard, you know, Boston, the land of the bean and the cod. I can talk about beans too, although I wasn't planning in this talk, but why are we the land of the cod? Where were we selling it back to Europe? Where did it go? A couple of different places. Um, a lot of cod was sold to Europe. You've heard of bacalao in Portuguese, bacala. You've heard of all the salt cod dishes brandad in South of France. Um, but there was another major mar market in North America for the salt cod, which brought in a lot of money. And this was to slavery areas, particularly sugar plantations of the Caribbean, but also to a lot of slave owning areas in the South, anywhere that they didn't want to spend the money or time growing crops, uh, growing cattle, growing sources of protein because it wasn't profitable, people were buying salt cod. Um, you've heard Aki rice salt fish is nice and the rum is good every time of year, that old song from Jamaica. That salt fish is from New England. There isn't any cod off the coast of Jamaica. It's a fish of Northern waters. Um, the good stuff would get said to Europe, the higher grades and lower grades that couldn't be sold in Europe would be shipped down to sugar plantations. And um, people in New England made a lot of money shipping off cod to feed slaves. It was part of the triangle trade. So when you look at this cod in our state house, this thing that built New England, we're tied by water to cod, we're tied by water to the Caribbean. And, um, you know, it's useful to reflect on where the money comes from, on where our money came from, and what that means for how we're going to think about water and how we use land in the future. And with that, I'm going to bring us back to Boston, since we're already back in the State House, and talk a little bit more about how people use land in this city. Like I said, we have different, different streams coming through, and we're going back to another stream for a moment here. Okay. So Boston Common. 
over here is about where the water was. This little structure here is near where the water came out. Over here is the Boston Common. Over here is the Trimount. This side of Boston, the harbor side, is the economically important side. This is where they're shipping the cod off from. Over here on the Charles River side, you can't get the big boats over here. So it's not as economically useful. So this is where people were grazing their cows. That's what the common was for. It was for grazing sheep and cows. And before you talk about the tragedy of the commons, there were really strict limits on what people could do there starting from 1634 onwards. You could only have one cow or four sheep. There was one person, Elder Oliver was allowed to have his horse there for the early years of the Boston Common, but it wasn't a free for all. People were limited in what they could do, which is one reason why they kept on grazing sheep there until the 1820s, when Boston was a city of more than 40,000 people. And the mayor finally said, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to be grazing sheep in the middle of a city. Let's stop this here. Whereupon they had a lovely park in the middle of the city, which didn't have nearly as many sheep. And this is just, if you turn that map over, you can see a little bit more that the Boston Common was down here. All right. So bringing back this map again, this is what Boston looked like. We bought this Boston Common because people kept on grazing sheep. It was sort of I don't want to say grandfathered in, but it, it was already there. It was easy to make a park there. But the public garden is on land that didn't exist when Boston was settled. How did that come to be a park? How did that come to be such a large park there? I just want to show you, um, just to emphasize that it really wasn't there. Um, here is a map of Boston, of the shoreline of Boston, as it was in the 1630s. And down here, that red, the Boston shoreline is this dotted line of blue. And down in the red is where a fish weir was installed in 2003. You might ask why, what is a fishing weir? A fishing weir is basically a wall, a fence in the water where fish can swim behind it during high tide. And then at low tide, they get trapped behind it. You can pick them out pretty easily. It's a pretty common method of fishing used all around the world. Um, there were lots of them off the coast of the Cape Cod um, during the colonial area. A lot of colonial folks set them up. But they were also here in the Boston Common, uh, discovered in 1913 when they were excavating the land under the common for the subway. They suddenly started coming up upon all these pikes, all these links of wood, all these wooden spikes that were buried in the soil uh, about 10 feet down. And over the next couple of, uh, couple of decades, actually, most of the excavation happened in 1939, they found 65,000 stakes woven with brush underneath two acres of what is now the Boston Common. Um, from what we've learned, they were built probably over a period of about 1,500 years, and they were all located 28 to 40 feet below the Boston Common in the Back Bay. Um, and these were built about 5,300 years ago by the people who lived here, who were not colonists, and whose descendants still live here in Massachusetts. In fact, people for whom the state of Massachusetts is named, the Massachusetts people, possibly Wampanoag, possibly the right of other people, built these, these structures in the water to support themselves before, well, before 1630 by lots of years. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of the excavation. See, you can see the size. These are people standing here. And look, these are six feet tall in some cases, just dozens and dozens and dozens of these installations to catch fish. Just in the picture of a guy standing in a hole measuring it. Don't they all look very educated? Oh, look, he has a clipboard. Yeah, must be a professor type. This is a picture of a 2003 celebration of a remade fishing weir on the Boston Common. These are Wampanoag and Massachusetts tribal members who arrived to celebrate their ancestors and their role in shaping the land in living in this place and continuing role as part of Massachusetts. Um, there are so many monuments in Boston. Oh God, and the public garden is full of bronze statues of men on horseback and William Ellery Channing and various people standing who did things in the 19th century and did things during the Revolutionary War. And the Montmanon came there to celebrate the fact that their people have been here for more than 5,000 years living 
and being a part of this land and being able to make at least one monument that shows their role here and how they worked and lived with water. I think it's very cool. So the bottom of Boston Common was underwater and the people who built the fishing weirs went living there by the 1790s. The reason that some of the land around the public garden got filled in was because there was an unsavory occupation in Boston and that was making rope. Why did people in Boston need rope? Because like I said before, everybody was involved with shipping. If you're shipping things on a boat, you need rope. You need lots and lots and lots and lots of rope for all your sails, for your anchor, to keep stuff down in the middle of the wind, storms, all kinds of reasons. Except that, you know, before the 1830s or so, there weren't really rope making factories around. The way people made rope before industrialized factories got invented was you'd have a long building, usually without any windows, because who wants to spend money on windows? Windows are expensive. It would be about as long as you want your rope to be. And you'd start at one end with your fiber, which might be coconut fiber or hemp or whatever you got around. And you twist it together. And you walk backward and you twist, and you walk backward and you twist, and you walk backwards and you twist and twist and twist all along the length of the building until you get to the big barrel bubbling cauldron of tar at the other end of the building. And you dip the ends in the tar to hold them together. And you've got your rope. You dip both ends in the tar, it's held together, it's twisted, you can use it. Long, narrow, windowless wooden buildings with kettles of hot tar on them were fire traps. And in the 1790s, the rope walks, which used to be over on the Faneuil Hall side of Boston on the harbor side burned down and took a pretty good chunk of the city with it. City fathers of Boston said, you know, we don't want this over here. Why don't you put that over at the bottom of that common where they just have a bunch of sheep where it won't bother people. And the rope walk makers said, sure, give us some land. City fathers of Boston said, okay. And they filled in the land. They filled in the mud flat at the bottom of the common and the rope walkers, rope makers, <laughs> they were walking, but they were actually making rope, not walking on it. Um, set up shop down there. And you can see on this map, one, two, three, four, five rope walks there at the bottom of the Boston Common, which burnt down again in 1810. And they burnt down again in 1820. And at that point, the city fathers of Boston, which had expanded considerably by then said, you know, this is too dangerous for a populated area. We can't have you there anymore. And the rope, the rope walk owners said, okay, pay us. And the city fathers of Boston did. And I don't know if they made more money by making rope or by selling land, which had been built for them. I don't know, but they were left with this land. Something had to be put there. That's where we got the Boston Public Garden from, from lots of decision makers making around what to do with this land that was next to Boston's most prominent park. It is 45 minutes in. I'm going to speed up because I want to show you some more interesting things. Okay, here's a map of Boston from about 1621. And I just wanna show you real quickly. Uh, remember I talked about the blocking of the Charles River? This red line, which you may know as Beacon Street today, that was the dam that was put up. You can see how that would interfere with the river coming in, with um, any of the tidal river coming in and scouring out and sweeping away anything that was building up here that you just couldn't anymore. Um, these yellow lines are bridges, which also interfere with the water circulation. Okay, here's just a picture of what Beacon Street looked like back then. Look, there's water, there's a bridge, there's water, there's a bridge, there's a boat. You've got some houses there. There's water over here. This is the public garden. This is what it looked like in about 1850 after the public garden was put together. Something else to look at here, little tiny trees. When I think of the public garden, I think of all these huge arching Amor Kark trees and the Dawn Red ones, but they started out small, it's changed. Okay. Uh, another couple of pictures of the garden. Again, the garden with small trees. Look, the swans melted. There they are, the swan boats today. All right. Commonwealth Avenue Mall. This was built as part of the development of the Back Bay. And I love looking at old pictures just to show how much 
parks change over time. You know, when you're dealing with plants, it's not like building a pyramid at Giza. You can't just leave them there for, you know, 4,000 years and come back and say, oh yeah, I recognize that. They grow, they die, they have cycles of life. They need to be maintained. They need to be attended to. This is the statue of Alexander Hamilton put on the Commonwealth Avenue Mall. This would have been sometime in 1860s. The Commonwealth Avenue Mall was built to look like a Parisian Grand Allée because of course, Boston was the Paris of America. Not that anybody ever called Paris the Boston of France, but this was fashion. This is what people aspired to in, in mid-century Boston in the 19th century. And they made, again, this very Parisian looking boulevard. Here's Alexander Hamilton, 1860s. Here's what he looks like now. Short trees, tall trees, open windswept space, enclosed, close feeling, sheltered. Commonwealth Avenue Mall has a lot of different statues on it. You've got the Vendome Fire Memorial to the brave firefighters who died in 1972, finding that, that horrible fire. You've got Phyllis Wheatley and Lucy Stone um, and Abigail Adams and uh, many different dignitaries connected to Massachusetts and Boston. And then you have this guy. <clears throat> There is a statue of Leif Erikson, one of Iceland's most famous descendants, sitting on the Commonwealth Avenue Mall. You might ask, why is there a statue of Leif Erikson on the Commonwealth Avenue Mall? Well, because of this guy. Eben Norton Horsford, a Harvard professor and inventor of the Rumford baking powder, loved Vikings. And he loved the idea that Vikings discovered America. This was very popular in salons among the Cambridge elites in the late 19th century. And, uh, you know, Longfellow believed in this. There was a Norwegian fiddler named Ol Bull who would come to these salons, is very popular, who talked about how, oh, oh, yes, of course, the Norsemen discovered America long before anybody else was here. Um, Norrisford was very sincere and very devoted to his theories. He believed the foundation of a structure near his house was built by Leif Erikson. And there's a marker for that, a Memorial Drive, if uh, sort of near Cambridgeport. He felt he constructed a tower in Weston, the Norumbega Tower that some of you may be familiar with, which he claimed is also a home of the Vikings at Norumbega, which was, you know, a word by the Massachusetts people describing the area was actually meant Norvega for Norway. This is not true. And he funded the creation of that bronze statue of Leif Erikson and Commonwealth Avenue. Um, the thing to remember about the context here is all these activities were happening in the 18, late 1880s, early 1890s, when Boston was becoming very much a, what they would consider at the time a non-white city. You're talking about a time after the Civil War, when the United States has grappled very unsuccessfully with slavery and the questions of race and society, when there are immigrants from Italy and Armenia and Greece and a dozen other countries coming into Boston, when it's about a dozen years after the United States centennial and people in New England are feeling like they are losing their grip on the culture of America, that the colonial times, Boston was important, but now people are looking to New York. They're looking to the West Coast. They're looking to Texas. Boston no longer has sort of the, that cultural uh, predominance that it once had. It's not as important. And so people, they're looking for an excuse to celebrate whiteness, honestly. They're looking for Vikings. They're looking for these stories about a past that didn't exist to reassure them that that they still claim this place in a lot of ways. Um, it's very different from what we understand of how the Americas developed today. Uh, I'm gonna bring us back to Boston and away from the Vikings. I love this picture of the filling into the back bay of all the people in Boston picking through all the dust and all the gravel and all the junk that's being brought in from landfills to see if there's anything valuable there. This is a Winslow Homer etching from 1859 of the filling in. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna go into the back bay fence because you've been listening to me for a long time, but I just wanted to share some picture of what it looked like. Uh, back bay fence is entirely artificial. 
uh, there weren't any rivers in the Back Bay. You saw it was just basically just open water. This was created to manage water as the Back Bay was being filled in. It never really worked all that well. Water goes where water wants to. Um, and much of the Muddy River was put under culverts for most of the 19th century. It's being revealed nowadays uh, through the Muddy River Restoration Project. Here's just a lovely picture of, oh, isn't it lovely? Um, here is a backhoe dredging parts of the Muddy River today in the back bay fens, trying to clear it out of all the invasive plants and all the yucky stuff that's built up over the years. We're managing it. You know, it didn't exist. It was invented and it has to be maintained just like those trees in Commonwealth Avenue um, because water goes where it will. All right, another picture. Uh, yes. Looking at this picture of the renewed landscape and the Back Bay fans made me think of these pictures by Magnus and Bert of just the open plains that are created in the city where there once was open water. You know, we hearken back to what was there before sometimes when we've designed things. Okay, getting towards eight o'clock. I'm going to go over one more issue that has to do with how people think about land in Boston and Iceland, and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, Boston never had zombies, but in the early 19th century, Boston's burying grounds started to fill up. The city was filling up, you know, the population was doubling every 20 years, and all the old burial ground, there just wasn't that much space. Uh, grave diggers would do things like leave graves open all winter because you couldn't dig through the frozen soil, and piling people five or six deep, and this was extremely distasteful to New England Puritans. Uh, there was an editorial in 1925 that said, who would wish to be buried in a close city in a crowded graveyard, be deranged and knocked about, separated and disjointed long before the last trumpet sounds? Would we not rather lie serenely where the pure breeze rustles the honeysuckles and the field flowers, the long grass and the drooping willow, which cover and hang over our graves? Sure, that looks like a better alternative to being stuffed into, you know, in a public grave like that. Same time, you're getting ideas around nature, which are a little bit strange. I'm gonna read this quote from Ralph Aldo Emerson, and then I'm gonna explain why it's odd. Ralph Aldo Emerson, transcendentalist nature, intellectual movement, feeling that the way to connect with God, with the oversoul, with the universe, with something greater than yourself is to go and experience nature. You know, standing in the blithe air, my head bathed by the, and sorry, standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space. All mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. This is what could happen if you stood out in the forest too long, apparently, according to Ralph Aldo Emerson. Nature, experience of nature was supposed to bring you this great spiritual union. Except there was a problem with this in New England in the 1830s at this time when people were building Mount Auburn Cemetery and Forest Hill Cemetery to have some place where you could be in nature when you're at rest. This is a flip flap plant. It looks like a plant, solar powered. You can put it on your window and the, the little leaves go up and down. This is obviously not nature. What passed for nature in New England in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, 50s was not what we would call nature now. Between 1800 and 1850, Massachusetts went from 50% co forest cover to 25% forest cover. Forests were being taken down. They were being shipped away as timber. They were being burned to the extent that people stopped being able to use wood stoves in Boston by the 1840s because they couldn't get the wood. It had to be shipped in from Maine. You would go walking off in the woods, they would be woodlots. They'd already been chopped down once or twice, possibly three times by this time. There wasn't a lot of nature in Massachusetts. This thing that the transcendentalists were yearning for was something that had largely disappeared from their lives that didn't exist. I'm going to show you a couple pictures. Um, this is one of the Harvard Forest Dioramas. If you're ever out in Petersham, Massachusetts, they are supposed to illustrate the landscape history of New England across time. This is their vision of what New England in central Massachusetts looked like in 1740. Here's what it looked like by the 1830s. What the transcendentalists were looking for was something that had largely disappeared. 
And when places like Mount Auburn Cemetery, these places of nature that were so beloved, that were supposed to help people heal, were set up, they were completely artificial. They were designed. They were gardens. They were flip-flap plants. They were places that were planted and maintained. Here's an image of Mount Auburn Cemetery from, oh God, when was this? Sometime in the, oh, 1834. Um, this is important. See that there are people standing there being affected, surrounded by trees, very natural trees, even though they were specifically edited there. They were left there by whoever designed this. This is a grave of a phrenologist, Mr. Spursheim, who believed in, you know, poking around people's skulls to see what they might be. Note that there's a fence around this grave, so no one else can be buried with him without his permission, none of this five or six people at a time. Um, there are also some other interesting things going on here, like they see a Roman column tops on top of the grave. It's supposed to be very plain and not Christian, hearkening back to the primeval times when people were pure and pagan. There's lots to say about that. This is what Mount Auburn looks like today. There's a member of the Brookline Bird Club looking for a warbler down there on the right. Um, very green, but again, this is all maintained. This is all designed. This is mode. This isn't nature. This is imitation of nature. It's wonderful, but it's kind of a flip flat plant. Um, I'm gonna try and wrap this up in about five minutes here. I know it's getting late. Franklin Park, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, you know, the genius behind Central Park and the Emerald Necklace designed this park between 1878 and 1896. He liked the idea of nature, but not so that you could get in touch with God. He didn't talk about that. He was more concerned about nervous complaints of people living in the city, that they would be oppressed by all the noise and the dust and the horses, and that working men needed a place to relax. Except he had very definite ideas about how people should interact with parks. This is what Olmsted had in mind. You were supposed to be passive. You were supposed to be either riding in a carriage or strolling serenely around your park. You were not supposed to be playing ball. The city fathers were forced to buy a separate park across the street from Flanken Park for, so people had a ball field. It's called Harrenby Park now, but Olmsted would not allow them to build ball courts because that would not help with your nervous complaint. That wouldn't relax you. Olmsted was not known for actually talking to the people that he thought his park should serve, who had very different ideas of using park. For example, in New York in you know, 19th century, beer gardens were very popular with those working class that Mr. Olmsted thought should stroll around looking at sheep and serene scenes. Um, but this is what he made in Franklin with all that equipment was a giant sheep field for people to enjoy. And I just wanna note, this reminded me of Bert's picture of the sheep drive, which is also a flip flat plant. We look at Iceland from North America, from the United States and say, oh, look at that. It's so green. It's that big natural area. When Iceland was first covered, according to Skoger, which I'm probably also mispronouncing the Icelandic Forest Service, it was about 40% forest. Uh, there were birch trees in the valleys that reached up to 40 or 50 feet tall. Although, you know, around the coast, things were shorter and scrubbier because, you know, wind is not great for, for trees. Um, then people brought the sheep. Sheep are more valuable than birch trees. Sheep are very good. If you chop down some of your birch trees to make pasture for them, they will eat the little shoots down and keep the pasture open. And at this point, 95% of the original forest cover in Iceland has been destroyed. Um, about 2% of Iceland is forested. The Iceland government is trying to reverse that. But again, this is a landscape that's been affected by humans. It is not what Iceland was. And that may be good, that may be bad. The sheep seem to like it, but this is not a natural landscape. This is a landscape that is maintained largely by sheep, but the sheep were brought there by humans. And I want to show you what Franklin Park developed into once Mr. Olmsted was out of the picture, which was tennis courts. <laughs> People of Boston wanted active entertainment, it turns out, and not just to stroll out around looking at sheep. I'm sure you're familiar with the golf course, with the zoo, all sorts of things that Olmsted did not think was therapeutic. But this is a public park and people need space in the public park to do what they want to do. And there's always going to be controversy about that. Um, in most Boston suburbs, people argue about things like, should there be mountain bikes there? 
Should there be dogs in this park? Who has a right to the park? What activities are allowed there in our garden? Because these are not natural areas. These are places that are managed for humans and by humans. With that, I will come to our final image, going back to Magnus. It's not a swan boat. It's not an ice swan. It's an actual swan that's swimming in an area that flooded on the border of Belmont, right over the border in Waltham. Um, this may be due to increased rainfall due to the climate change that water isn't draining, partly because it's on top of an area of pavement, non-permeable surface. So it can't soak into the ground. There's, there's just nothing for way for it to soak in. There aren't any pores there. So the water gets stuck. Um, if the pavement weren't there, the water would soak into the soil. It would get purified, would flow out to, let's see if this is in the Waltham side of it, probably to the Charles River. Belmont is between two watersheds between the Mystic and the Charles. And then it would flow out to the harbor and out to the ocean and possibly out to nourish a cod or two with some of the bits of plants that would be picked up on the way. Um, but it's a change from how Belmont was 50 years ago, how Belmont was 100 years ago, how Belmont was 14,000 years ago when it was covered in ice. And as we think through our future and how we make choices about the environment, about justice, about who belongs in the land and how we acknowledge them, I hope that we can think through our past and use it to make wise choices for our future. And that is the end of my talk. And I would be happy to take questions. Thank you very much for coming this evening. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Oh, thank you one last so thing. much. Oh. Follow me on Instagram if oh, you want to see pictures yes. of ice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Meg. That was such an amazing talk. I, I feel like the image of Bert's waterfall was such a great explanation in front, you know, they spread <laughs> apart and come together again. And it's all very exciting. And, and, and you even fit in dead people. I When I said that at the beginning, I didn't realize we were going to have ghosts. <laughs> oh, it, it, it's just fantastic. I'm sure there'll be a lot of comments or questions. I've got a few, but there's yes, even dead people who aren't actually there in Mount Auburn, um, yes. like Margaret Fuller. She died in a shipwreck and they have a grave for her there, but her body is in the water. So, you know, another ocean connection. Yeah, it's all the connections and the correspondences and how you wove the photographs in. And now I'm going to see things differently. You know, maybe Emerson got to be a clear eye ball, but you've like focused my vision so I can see things in a more interesting way in the context of time and different perspectives. It's just great. Um, I, with Sophronia and I were saying things like, uh, oh, wow, and laughing and uh, Leif Erikson in a miniskirt. <laughs> <laughs> the word is utilikilt, but anyway. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Magnus, where is your miniskirt? <laughs> It's made of so, stone, so it's not like it's going to fly up in the wind or anything like that. You know, it's it's pretty well weighted. I know. I need to work on acquiring a proper Viking outfit. <laughs> yeah, a, a tilt. What a yeah, a, a kilt that would be a great thing of some kind. <laughs> Thank well, you, Mike. That was fantastic. Yeah. I learned so much about Boston. <laughs> there's there's a lot out, but you know, we've been around for a while and. There are just so many different histories of cities. There's so many different groups of people who come through and had different effects on, on the land and what we do. Um, and yeah, we've been around here for a long time. And there's so much stuff we, you know, we talk so much about, you know, the Redcoats are coming and Paul Revere, but there's a lot more than that that's been going on, so. Um, so so I, I, I feel like I've just watched an episode of Connections. Um, <laughs> And, and, that's the name of our show yes and and and, and it was terrific and um uh, um i'm really glad that it's being recorded because i feel like i want to watch it and pause and you know make notes and go back and forth it, you know i i'm really very very much in awe of all the research that you did to dig up all of these little details that you know that that fit together to the story um so so i, I just want to really express my admiration and thanks for that. It was terrific. You're welcome. And Magnus, I 
I love your photos so much. It's just, you haven't taken that many photos of historic Boston as opposed to current day Boston. That's why I couldn't fit as many in as I'd like, but. Well, that, that can be the task for the next uh, photo a day year. <laughs> <laughs> right, every, um, every photo has to include something that's more than a hundred years old. Oh, I'll, I'll uh, consider uh, that as a task. I, I, I almost included your picture of the Black Falcon Pier because, you know, Boston, that area of Boston is so vulnerable to rising tides, rising ocean levels and climate change. And you see the, the constant pictures nowadays of water coming up over the aquarium area and around the stop there and around the children's museum. And um, yeah, it's, it's part of Boston to watch. There's actually a little bit of interesting history about that building uh, right out. I mean, it's Black Falcon Pier is basically one building. Um, it was built by the Navy and some parts of it have walls that are three feet thick. And you can guess why. Navy, thick walls. <laughs> it was an ammo depot, I, I guess, in World War II. Huh. Ammunition so, depot? Yeah. It's a strange building. We have a weird sense of where to put hazardous stuff in Boston, you know, like... <laughs> Well, the Malathus flood was right on top of one of the most populated, densely populated areas in Boston. That's part of the reason that, you know, 20, 18 people died and so much was wrecked. You know, that's why there was a, a train going right by, which, you know, the, the tracks got wrecked because there was a lot of stuff coming there. Oh, yeah, let's put, you know, a million gallons of hot molasses right here. It's just... Oh, yes, that's, a, that's another good book, uh, The Great yes. Molasses Flood. <laughs> yes, which was the Belmont Town Read, what, five years ago? It was dark yeah. tide. Well, so or more, I think. Um, dark tide. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. Um, I see. There's a the Zoom user who doesn't have a name mentioned that it would be great to know the geologic history of Belmont. Where does Belmont Hill come from? Is that a a drumlin? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is something I usually, when I do a talk that's more oriented towards gardens as opposed to gardens plus food plus currents and things like that. Um, you know, coming up here makes it really easy to learn geology, much easier than New Jersey, because every question you answer with the word glacier. Um, <laughs> Bel I'm pretty sure Belmont Hill is put there because of glaciers. Um, as we were talking about before, people community, uh, you can see, you know, glacial structures um, in the Western Greenway if you take off, oh, what is the name of that land? Um, if you're going west from Rock, Widow, Rock Meadow and continuing, you can see eskers in the middle of the woods next to the carriage road, you know, these elevated areas, which are, you know, the long, thin glacial mm -hmm. deposits. Um, uh, I know that I live on the side of a hill um, here in Lexington, Whipple Hill. And if you dig down, you can't really find a clay layer just because so much of the existing soil was just ground off by the glaciers. It's basically just all sand all the way down. When we tried to make a pizza oven uh, about a decade ago, you're supposed to dig down and get the clay from your yard and make it into the clay and make, we didn't have any clay. We had to go get it at my mother's house in New Jersey because it just, just don't have it. Oh, you imported New Jersey clay. That's great. <laughs> Yet another strain. Uh, pizza. It's from New Jersey. It's pizza. You know. It's good. It's good. <laughs> That's good. That's wonderful. I was fascinated to hear about all the stuff going into the landfill. I'd always heard about landfill, but uh, the idea of whatever going in there, it reminded me of a book that I read um, about a thing they do in the, around the town. It's called mudlarking um, because mm -hmm all the stuff that's been buried and dropped in the Thames over the years with the tide coming in and out, you can walk at low tide and just pluck, you know, an old pipe or a piece of pottery or a, even, you know, something flint napped or, or whatever. I guess we don't have that because the Charles is dammed up, but, but if we went looking, we would find so we'll find some of those the the fish the wampanoag in the uh, massachusetts built those wonderful fish things you showed us and they're still there yeah you know, they're, they're, well i mean we've excavated two acres of them but there's probably more up and down that just haven't been located yet that people haven't been excavating in exactly the right areas um two things here um if you go to faneuil hall if you go to the um the what was 
the, the Daniel Hall, not, not the marketplace, but the hall run by the National Park Service um, on the second floor next to the big meeting room where we all discussed freedom, except for the people who were slaves in Massachusetts at the time, people enslaved people, pardon me. Um, they have an exhibit where they show some of the stuff that was excavated from under the hall when they were installing the elevators basically. And they just found an incredible amount of stuff down there, pottery and peanuts and watermelon seeds, all these things that were imported, they were just thrown down to make the edge of the dock. Because it's so fascinating. I mean, know. it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a garbage pit wherever you look, I guess, because, you know, yeah. when you're yeah. doing archaeology somewhere else, it's like, ah, a midden, yay. It's like, Boston, it's a midden. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but that's where things like um, the privies next to the African meeting house have different foods included there than in some of the other areas that have been done around Boston, um, like turtles and things like that, which may have been uh, reflect the heritage of people who escaped from the South and brought their foodways with them. Um, the city of Boston archaeology has all sorts of fun stuff. Um, you know, they've excavated other privies along um, the big dig uh, and shown sort of the evolution of what types of fish people were eating at different times and a particular privy belonging to a woman who got divorced and her income went down and the change in the different food she had at that time. She got divorced because her husband tried to poison her and run off with a maid. It was a really horrible story. Um, but they have documentation of her and her changes in income and, and the different layers of things. So city of Boston archaeology, really cool stuff because again, it's just everywhere you look. Um, and we also have really important laws about filled tidelands because, you know, in an earthquake, all those brick buildings built on top of basically a bunch of gravel on a mud flat, they're going to come down. It's, it's really hazardous. Um, there was a, remember there was an earthquake about five years ago and people in downtown really felt it. And up here we said, eh, <laughs> that's the people downtown sitting in places like the Prudential Center, you know, they're basically in a blob of jello with rocks in it. Wow. Very stable. wow. So when is the big one coming? <laughs> I don't know. The new, there was um, the new Madrid quake reached up here and, and rattled some things back in 1820s, the one from Tennessee. Um, there was a big earthquake, wasn't it? Okay, never mind. I don't, I'm yeah. not going to update for you. There was a big earthquake during colonial times, which made yeah. the Mathers upset. Yeah, I, I remember oh, hearing yeah. about that. But oh dear, the Mathers were upset. <laughs> <laughs> the Mathers encouraged people to kill innocent women in Salem. They had a lot of they had a lot of power. You know, you didn't want to get them upset at you. You didn't want to get them upset. You wanted them nice and calm. On the other hand, they also helped Jeez. with the first vaccination efforts in Boston. There you, you go. Know? No uh, mud, no lotus. Was brought by um, a man who was renamed Honest Simus. He was um, an enslaved man brought from Africa to Boston who had experience with uh, variolation, putting small mm -hmm. uh, cowpox into people to prevent smallpox. And it wasn't cotton, it was his father um, owned him and took up his technique to stop the smallpox in, in Boston. This was around 1710, I'm going to have the wrong name, but yeah, the Mathers believed in witchcraft, but they also believed in vaccination. <laughs> what goes around comes around. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting. I'm thinking also of glaciers when you do those core samples down through the glaciers and you can tell over thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of years the different climate and stuff like that. And then thinking of the microcosm of that woman's privy you know, in her life, the different things that changed in her privy and in the global life of through through the iceberg, I mean, through the glacier. We have our own version of that. Um, you remember I showed the Harvard Forest dioramas about the different phases of landscape? Yeah. They've done a lot of core sampling from lakes in New England on Cape Cod, but also in central Massachusetts. And what you get, um, it's called paleonology, P-A-L-Y, Technology. you're looking at what different types of pollen there are as you go down through layers of mud and down and down and down and down and down. And they can track when different trees were here um, and when uh, trees were basically chopped down and when agriculture came in. Uh, we got corn pretty late here in New England. We, you know, sorry, the people who were here got corn pretty late, only around 1000 AD, which um, it wasn't really a major food source for the Wampanoag, the Patuxet, and the other peoples who were living here before then, which is which is late for the Americas. Most other people adopted it earlier. Um, 
And you can track that with, with the samples as to how much was being grown around there. It's really, really cool. So, um, you know, like hemlock trees disappeared at one point, you know, about 2000 years ago, just gone. Then they came back. Um, and there are different changes which reflect the weather as to what kinds of proportions of trees you have, like sugar maples, they like it cold. They don't like to go down to the coast. It's too warm. Oh, it's too wet. Me. Um, <laughs> And they, they ebb and come back depending on, on the weather. So you can see shifts in climate that happened before and compare them to what's happening now. And also that sometimes trees just disappear and you don't know why. You know, our current for it, you know, this one behind me, yeah. they should have chestnut trees in it. It doesn't because of the chestnut blight happening hundred years ago. Um, it should have more ash trees. The ash trees are having problems because of ash borers now. Are they going to come back? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe we're going to get more of the trees that are more common in New Jersey. You know, we already have sassafras. Um, maybe more tulip trees are going to grow spontaneously instead of just in people's yards. I don't know, but um, it's not just ice. You can also get things from lakes and mud. And um, there's some really cool stuff out there. So cool. Sorry, I'm what about, what I just about, love all this stuff. It's just so cool. It's just wonderful. What about invasive species? I mean, invasive species, how do we know that they're not just the new uh, uh, the thing that's going to move in? You know, all the all the maple trees are going, oh, it's not cold enough. So they're dying off and whatever invasive species are coming up from New Jersey or whatever. I mean, shouldn't we just be encouraging anything that can grow? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there are, the, there are a couple of different issues in what you're talking about. I'm going to, I think the current word is unpack. A please, please. Okay. <laughs> non-native versus invasive okay there are plants which are growing in perfect harmony with our ecosystem uh dandelions nobody's worried about dandelions i mean some people don't like them in their lawn i think they're wrong i think dandelions are cute they're a hardy perennial you know you don't have to trim them or bedhead them or anything um but they coexist when you have dandelions you don't get a field of just dandelions it may feel like that sometimes, but you generally, you know, get other stuff, you get some grass, you get some plantains, you get clover, you get other stuff growing at the same time. Um, one of the most significant ecological effects of Europeans moving here was the importing of grass. All that grass in your lawn, that's not native. Um, it evolved to, most of the grass you're planting is not stuff that comes from America. It's, it's stuff that's bred from Europe. It's stuff that co-evolved with cows, with some sort of grazing animal to chew it down. That's why we have to mow it all the time because it's supposed to be living with stuff that's eating it. Much like our prairies co-evolved with buffalo and do better when they're eaten down on a regular basis and they can deposit some carbon in the soil from having their roots draw back. That's a lot of things. So not native is not the same thing as invasive. Um, there's a lot of debate over what is invasive and what isn't. Um, a definition that I like personally as someone with a little bit of expertise, but not a heck of a lot of expertise is are you increasing biodiversity or are you reducing it? You know, you bring in something like a Norway maple, which is extremely popular, extremely hardy street tree, um, grows all kinds of tough places you can't get other trees to grow. So there are benefits to it, okay? You know, if you're growing a tree in the city, you wanna have shade, you wanna have that local temperature reduction, you want it to feel nice. There are advantages to Norway maples, but you introduce them in the suburbs, nothing grows underneath them first of all, because they have incredibly dense and shallow roots. They basically suck the water away from everything else. You talk to any gardener, it's really hard to grow anything aside from a juga, maybe a couple of other things underneath the Norway maple. So you've got it reducing the local biodiversity underneath. Whereas when you look at hickory forests, you've got blueberries growing underneath, you've got Solomon's seal, you've got you know all sorts of different things that can sort of coexist with it that came here. And there, one of the Boston Harbor Islands the one that used to have military housing for officers on it, I'm not remembering, it's not spectacle. It has a Norway maple forest. There is nothing growing in this particular area of Boston Harbor Island except Norway maples and slightly shorter Norway maples and slightly taller Norway maples. There's nothing else there. It forms a monoculture. It forms a place where nothing else can grow underneath it. Nothing else can grow around it. Nothing else can grow with it. It is reducing the biodiversity. That's, that's not, it's not playing well with others. Um, you know, I've heard complaints about how, oh, when people talk about foreign invasive plants, they're actually talking about immigrants and we shouldn't be talking about plants like that. It's a cultural thing. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, seriously, something, anytime people talk about plants, they're actually talking about people, okay? This, this was true. Um, I'm gonna give you a really quick example, then I'm gonna get back to invasives. 1890s, Charles Sprague Sargent, the head of the, the Arnold Arboretum, you know, which belongs to Harvard, which of course knows everything. Um, big into the, let's only plant native plants of New England. Um, I mean, in the Arboretum, they have an educational collection, you know, pines from different areas of the world, oaks from different parts of the world. But he says, you know, in Boston parks, we should only have New England things, which was really code for, we only want to have stuff for white people and not from those awful immigrants. It's pretty mm. clear, the period of stuff is, you know, people talk about what's on their minds, except the superintendent of the Boston Public Garden of Time was a man named William Doog, who was an Irish immigrant who apparently had a brogue. I'm not gonna imitate it. I'm from New Jersey. I knew New Jersey imitations. I'm not gonna imitate Boston Irish people. It's just be disrespectful. And he basically said, I'm planting a garden for the people, not that, and he was his words, Harvard blockhead. And he basically ignored all of Strag Sargent's suggestions, just blew them off. And he grew bright, pretty flowers, which everybody loved. And that's what we have in the public garden still today. You know, they have these bright red cannas and they have palm trees. They have a special palm house they have to store them in the middle of the winter because they can't survive here in New England. You know, they have red and pink and purple and orange tulips all planted next to each other. Um, they just make people happy. Um, and they're non-native. And um, Mr. Duke was responding because he saw that Mr. Sargent was insulting immigrants and insulting their taste in public gardens. And wow. he was right. The public garden, it's the middle of a city. It's on land that didn't even exist. Sure, plant some tulips, whatever. Um, when you're talking about bringing things up from warmer climates like New Jersey or North Carolina, which is what Massachusetts is, might be in about 30 years, if we continue on the track we're going, I hope we don't. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of debate in the parks community and the plant conservation community that I've seen from the National Park Service and also from the Native Plant Trust about what do you do with plants? For a lot of plants, we're not really sure what their complete native range is. You know, if you find it on a mountaintop in New Hampshire, is it not somewhere else because it couldn't get there somehow because it can't survive somewhere else? Or has it just not been tried? If you have a plant on a mountaintop in New Hampshire that's getting warmer and you think it's going to die, is it right to carry it to a different location where it hasn't been before? basically doing even more manipulation of the ecosystem? Do you let it die out? Um, for a lot of plants, at least as of the conference I went to about four years ago, it's not really clear what their actual range could be. We know where they are now. Doesn't mean that they weren't in a larger range earlier, you know, with the paleonology, with the trees, with the pollen. For, you know, pretty common plants, you can figure out that they were there, but you know, like trailing arbus, that's not, it's, a, it's our state flower like the Mayflower, um, it's small. You're not gonna find a heck of a lot of pollen in these big lakes, which are filled with like maple trees. How much of it was in Worcester in year 1000? How much of it could be in year 2100? There's, there's a lot we don't know. Um, I mean, my basic bias is I want more different stuff around. So that- diversity. Yeah. I think of a lot of these invasive plants like Walmart, okay? <laughs> when Walmart moves into town, great, you have more stuff available, you lower prices. And over time, you notice that all the little mom and pop stores are disappearing and all the local suppliers are disappearing. And maybe you can't find that honey from the producer down the road because they can't sell anything anymore because they don't have anywhere to sell it. And, you know, you initially get a lot more diversity of stuff around and then over time you get much less. And that, that happens a lot. So I think Walmart is a much better analogy. Okay. And foreign stuff. Well, it's almost time to say yeah. goodbye. Um, thank you so much, Meg. Um, this was fantastic. I just wanted to let people know um, this will be recorded and we'll have it on our YouTube channel and you can use it too, Meg. Um, we've got. Hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. <laughs> <Where's Brownie? laughs> um, we've got uh, Bert in the gallery this weekend from one to four. And uh, he's going to have on Sunday. chocolate kisses. <laughs> Do you want to stop by? <laughs> and next yes, week we please. have a special talk um, given by Magnus and Bert, a uh, technical photography talk, which should be Ooh. fantastic. Yes, lots of interesting things to learn. 
So thank you all for coming so much. And thank you, Meg, for a wonderful talk. Julie um, DiStefano uh, of the Belmont Media Channel uh, Center, please thank you very much uh, for helping us with this. Appreciate it so much. And Thanks, thank you Meg, for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Meg. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you. Bye.